Good morning. <coughs> Now this session, uh, explanation about the Buddha Dharma. So I extremely happy. We have Buddhist brothers and sisters from uh, different Buddhist countries. First in Mongolia, then I think from Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, then Korea, hmm? Thailand. Thai, that's right. Hmm? In Chinese? Korea. You Chinese? No. Huh? So, the Buddhists from Sri Lanka and Thailand, they are the practitioner of Pali tradition. So that is the foundation of Buddha Dharma. And among Buddhist follower, the holder of Pali tradition, or the el uh, elder, So my respect. Then Sanskrit tradition is concerned. Our Chinese Buddhist, and then Korea, uh, Japan, uh, Vietnam, and Tibet and Mongolia. Uh, so, China among them, the Chinese tradition or Chinese, what's the uh, the Sanskrit Sanskrit tradition holder, Chinese Buddhist or holder of uh, Sanskrit. Sanskrit tradition, are uh, senior. So then, we Tibetan. Our youngest, only after seventh century. Mongolia's case. I heard uh, first Buddhism reach Mongolia, perhaps before reaching Tibet. First one, and second, and third. Then uh, Buddhism come from Tibet. So today is uh, uh, Buddha Dharma, which practicing by Mongolian, does come from Tibet. So for Tibetan case, Indians are our guru. In the Mongolians case, we are their guru. <laughs> <laughs> so now basically, The uh, Pali tradition and the Sanskrit tradition, uh, two traditions. The Sanskrit tradition, uh, I mean, the, uh, the Pali tradition also is the so the take. No. So some kind, some kind of I think combine Pali tradition as a foundation, then Sanskrit tradition. In the Sanskrit tradition, the I think Buddhist logics maybe I think develop uh, much stronger in the extensively ka, more extensively more extensive in the Sanskrit tradition. Then also the Buddhist tantrayana, Buddhist tantric. Uh, also, then I think uh, in Sanskrit tradition, Buddhist Tantrayana also much uh, is present. No. Uh, so, so then Tibetan tradition 
since the patent tradition, which is started after Nalanda, famous Nalanda tradition, well established in India. Therefore, Tibetan tradition, the, actually the pure lineage of Nalanda tradition. That's very clear. Uh, all those major texts of Buddhism, uh, mainly Sanskrit and some Pali, uh, which we learned Study. Uh, by heart from young age. Rimshi Thoma Pesha Lunzinshi do Pol Kazere. Pesha Thoma Lunzinshi do Pol Kazere. Pesha Pesha Sindu. Ha. Chiang Aze. Oh. Uh, his case, around 14, 15 years, a start with learning. My case, about six, seven years, very young, I started learning by heart. At that time, no interest <laughs> <laughs> almost like a burden. <laughs> So in daily so time, when, the, when my tutor come, uh, that almost much um, I used to feel almost as if the sun was setting and getting darker. <laughs> <laughs> so such a student is a really, uh, let's say, I think, uh, uh, I always uh, prefer play like that. So maybe a uh, stupid student. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so my point is, all those texts which we learned by heart, all wrote by Nalanda masters. So it is quite clear. And then later, uh, we, we study. study commentaries of these root texts. So Tibetan Buddhism, I usually describe uh, the Theravada tradition and the Sanskrit tradition, including Buddhist Tantayana tradition, all complete. So that's an Alanda tradition like one of top considered scholar as well as Buddhist master Nagarjuna. He himself, you see, wrote uh, uh, Tantrayana and of course Madhimika philosophy. Uh, Madhimika philosophy, I think something like uh, combined with logics. So Nagarjuna, one of the top scholar of the Nalanda, is logician, also philosopher, also very good Buddhist monk, uh, and also uh, physicians, and also some kind of chemistry. Um, so also uh, a kind of a chemist as well. Uh, so we can, I think, consider him as a, at that time, sort of what's a uh, scientist. So his brain is really brilliant. Uh, in his writing, the uh, what say he make very precise sort of say the distinction. A certain Buddha's what is the word uh, which he found contradictory with logic reasons, logical reason. Then he rejected these things. Then, then those, only those texts which logically can prove, then he accept these are the 
these are definitive statements of the Buddha. Because Buddha himself is made clear that my follower uh, accept my teaching not uh, out of respect, but rather your own investigation and experiment. So he make very clear some kind of liberty uh, to, I say, to investigate Buddha's own word. Because the Buddha is taught different philosophies uh, due to among his followers there are different mental disposition. Therefore, he deliberately uh, teach different philosophy or different concept, which itself contradictory. So sometimes I jokingly is <coughs> telling audience uh, there is contradictory philosophy uh, taught by Buddha, one Buddha, same Buddha, same teacher. So certainly, it is not, uh, not certainly not due to his own confusion. <laughs> certainly not. Nor he deliberately create confusion among his student. Certainly not. Then, why he taught is in these different philosophy, contradictory philosophy? The answer is there are different uh, sort of mental disposition, mental capacity uh, in different karmic what is it, eh? um, uh, no. uh, There are differences among the individual's karmic propensities. So, this very helpful is it to look at the tradition, non-Buddhist tradition. Uh, yes, there are people uh, who may not find Buddhist approach is suitable. So we need different approach, different way of approach. according uh, different mental disposition of people at different location, different time. So this uh, very helpful we see, to develop what's the cause of the accept of pluralism of religions is very useful. <clears throat> So Tibetan tradition, in some time ago, I mean, the earliest, early part of the 20th century, some scholar described Tibetan Buddhism as uh, not genuine Buddhism, but something deviated. Right? No, okay. uh, deviant now. Uh, and called degenerate. Lama Yi. Ah. Degenerate form of Buddhism. Uh, degenerate of Buddhism which called Lamaism. I think that is, uh, I think, expression or description of lack of knowledge. So usually, I always see telling or introduce Tibetan Buddhism is pure tradition of Nalanda institution. But then, meanwhile, I also want to say, the eighth century, the one, one of top logicians as well as the philosopher or master uh, of Nalanda, came to Tibet. His name Shantarakshita. He, I think, encouraged 
Tibetan emperor. Now, you Tibetan should uh, should hold Buddha Dharma through your own language. So it is much better translate. In Mongolia's case, now for example, is through centuries, uh, although they have their own language, their own script, but they prefer, you see, study with Tibetan language. Right. Uh, in Tibet case, they, I think really, I think Kazoda, broad-minded or uh, wise or far-sighted, yes, far-sighted. I think both Tibetan emperor and mainly, I think the Nalanda, this particular sort of scholar, he advised uh, all those texts should translate into Tibetan. So at Samya Monastery, there's supposed, I think, the first monastery, you see, uh, Buddhist monastery in Tibet. Uh, in Tibet. Uh, actually, that monastery, it said the uh, construction of that monastery carried under the uh, instruction of Shandarakshita. So there are different department. One department for translation. One department for the meditation. One department for Vinaya Kasoda. Um, a monastic discipline. Hmm? And start uh, taking monk's vow. So first time, 8th century under that master's leadership. Another department, like more ritual or ceremony, or Tanzian. And of course, meantime, the Pema Sambhava also there. Uh, he carry, I think his direct responsibility is to eliminate all the negative forces of Buddha Dharma. And in the meantime, he also used to carry some uh, uh, tantric teaching. So eventually, Tibetan language, now, today, I think up to, uh, up to now, the Tibetan language is the one of the, I think, almost, I think, the best language among the translations of original Sanskrit, Sanskrit text. Sanskrit text. Uh, <clears throat> So the, in the 20th century, some uh, uh, Western scholars, scholars. Said they found Tibetan translations are very authentic. Accurate. Uh, accurate. Accurate. Now, um, Now only one hour. Mm. So I don't know how to start actual explanation about the Buddha Dharma. Mm. Perhaps uh, now I uh, shift switch. 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 Uh, to language. The Shijing Doi Chikjari, Lek Jagda Chik, Semla Sem Machiti, Sem Jirangshin Vesao Sachi, Di Tubusum Chen, Semla Sadigi, Maranzi Samaloda, Chi Didu Saw Shum Sachi Yari, Didu Saw Di, the Semi Pembucha Gan Yamari, Sem Dengan Yari, Chazangako, Sheba the Joy of the Vijay, Tindy Hindu, Chi Semi Pembun, Nichi Samayimba, 
Nang Sheva Sati, Mototana Sheva Sheviare, Semla Ta Tawata Tunga Sati, Tartuna, Sim Tu Motugitene, any Tituti on the Yare Sim Tu Chaja Shana Pentatria, never Messia, Tigi, Rana Tawaya, Sim Matu, Shana Tawacha, Tigi, Rana Dumia. ตินดีเป็นดิซานเนสัมแคชมูลิสสัมลาสตาวนะตินดีกะสัมดีเอนี่มารานโซลอลิยาญอยะทานเนลอมเชบะเซจาโซลอลิยาจิกเลมุตั
um, then points towards the ultimate nature of mind. The ultimate nature of mind is a phenomenon that whose reality and no, existence. Sir, ultimate nature is always no. conventionally. The same Rashi. So the, the, the final part, um, the nature of mind is clear light, points towards uh, the nature of mind where its reality can only be understood in terms of dependent relations of causes and conditions. And beyond that dependent relation, uh, one cannot posit a mind that is separate from that relationship. And furthermore, it also uh, points to us that in its essential nature, mind is pure. You know, mind, our mind is uh, deluded, uh, uh, but these delusion and the pollutants of the mind are advantageous. And the pollutions of the mind, contamination, really result from kind of uh, uh, more uh, um, thought processes and conceptual processes uh, which has the tendency to obscure and, and taint our essential nature of the mind. However, uh, the mind, the essential nature of mind is uh, luminosity and this mere experience and in, at that level uh, our mind is uh, clear light, our mind is uh, free of pollution. So, so these things are pointed out in this one statement of the Buddha that mind is devoid of mind because the essential nature of uh, uh, the nature of mind is clear light. Then this love chopper no some chance that some la sa digi that some two mo digi thane di du yan yi bin du sa ne ding shi nam sha di some la sa di ne thane mu ya de some ma chi di sa digi some me ba ge ma ru ta some la some ma chi di the same di เออเซมเกเอ่อรังชินเวสเซมเซมยอเรเซมทรุเดยอเรอินิชิสตูยอเรสลาวินะทรุยอมาเรสซาติเดอินดุซานเนเอ่อดีกับละเชนยิสุน
then you cannot find <coughs> a phenomenon that is solid, concrete, and independent uh, of, of the basis upon which uh, the phenomenon, the label mind is being applied. So here, um, one can speak about uh, what the, the, the middle way philosophers school and mind only school uh, talk about three natures of the mind. Uh, so here, when we speak about the nature of mind, so the mind uh, itself would be the, uh, the basis and uh, um, um, what is being negated is the, our imputation of mind as possessing some kind of truly substantial reality. So that is the imputed nature. And then the absence of that imputed nature on the basis, which is mind, is the, the, empt the empty, emptiness nature or the thoroughly uh, established nature. So what it points to is that mind, which we assume to possess this real existence, uh, is actually devoid of such uh, substantial reality, and that absence of that substantial reality is the mind's true nature. And then the third part, da because the the real existence, right? No, uh, mm -mm. no, uh, substantially real existence. Oh, uh -huh. no. um, so the third part, because the mind is clear light, the natural mind is clear light, then can be seen as pointing towards the Buddha's teaching on. The, the Buddha nature, uh, the Tathagata Garbha, the essence of Buddhahood. So when we speak of this the essence of Buddhahood, the seed of Buddhahood, uh, it can refer both to the emptiness of mind, which is the ultimate nature, but also to the clear light nature of mind, uh, which is a subjective quality of our uh, mind. And it is in respect to this second part of the nature, which is the clear light nature of mind, that the Buddhist Vajrayana teachings um, are related. It is in the exploration and deepening of understanding of that clear light nature of mind that the Vajrayana teachings become relevant. So, not finished. <laughs> <laughs> Introduction of Buddha Dharma. <laughs> that the so this is like the summary. That では だ、で、にがろうけ、知るて、連入に幸せんけ。え、ては、ちいも、インドさんね、とめてにうてきてんちゃいもやれ。て、とめ、さわてれちゃうだ。で、にうさんね、どじきとめさいしゃ。てんで
ดิลุนีบุติรานังกิจุลเตเนจุลเจนเตเนชุบินดุซานเนเดวุตุงเงมินดุบะติกิตุงเงกิจุติเชเบกวานเนแมกซอบุยาเรเอ่อเตนตุ
one need to look into the causes and conditions that would lead to this ultimate happiness that we are seeking for. And on the basis of that understanding, one must cultivate those causes and conditions. And it is on that basis one needs to fulfill that basic aspiration of seeking happiness and, and overcome suffering. So what this tells us, uh, illustrate, is a fundamental philosophical principle in Buddhism, which is the principle of dependent origination. Because in Buddhism, the key philosophical idea really is the understanding of the evolution and emergence of everything in terms of their causes and conditions alone. And it is through the aggregation and coming together of causes and conditions that events come into being. And so this points to uh, the Buddha's teaching on uh, Pratita Samubhada, uh, dependent origination, particularly in terms of causes and conditions. Tadi, tadi, kosa, tak kunjung tambah lebih undi, tak, oh ya, tanya lah. Jadi di sana cuma dia di tensi sumbe kedua ya, tensi mula dia bawa saya di sini sudah sumbe saja. ジェネシスだ。シーネスジェネシス。でね、え、天使チャールダバスレブルザネ、だ、シーネスジェネシベイルザネ、エネガナドトゲメデバダテワンダバレティンデイエンデ、エネランドンジュドジュクシャバレス
Or Tanner number of ten Goyagi, Dumzendi, Michi, Sanje Goya, she made to Tane, Dumze D. Chane, the Tondua, and Tangunda Korami, Sanje number of Tangunda Tension, the Guru, Cosato Sanje and Zavanzawa, Medua, Cosato Sanje and Zavanzawa, D. Me, Tanevaji, Sanji Goa, Truda, that did take it to her. So, um, now, when we look at the way in which Buddha actually taught the Four Noble Truths um, in the scriptures, we uh, see that um, um, Buddha repeated the statements of the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering and its origin, and the cessation and the path that leads to that cessation. Um, first, Buddha identified what are those four truths? Uh, what is suffering? What is the uh, um, origin of suffering? and what is the possibility of a cessation? What are the paths that would lead to that cessation? And by you know, sp uh, speaking of the specific natures of these Four Noble Truths, the Buddha, in a sense, uh, set out uh, um, an, our understanding of the nature of reality, how cause and effects uh, play in this, in this reality. And in the second uh, um, uh, um, uh, level, Buddha talked about the functions of these understanding of the Four Noble Truths, the nature of the Four Noble Truths. Um, and the function here is how, on the basis of the understanding of this nature of reality, uh, uh, as an individual, how should an individual go about implementing that knowledge into a day-to-day -day life and living an ethical uh, and spiritual way of life. Um, and then the third um, um, aspect that the Buddha uh, uh, spoke about on the teaching of the Four Noble Truths is how by you know, uh, applying these functions of, of the four no knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, what kind of uh, um, results that the individual practitioner would achieve. Um, and here, uh, Buddha made statements such as uh, uh, suffering must be recorded. So the first, he said, this is the truth of suffering. In this, with respect to the second, the function, he said, suffering must be understood or recognized. That's the function. And with respect to the purpose and, and the fruit uh, result, he said, uh, although suffering is to be understood and recognized, but there is no suffering to be understood and recognized. So what he is talking about here is that once you have, as a result of employing, applying your knowledge of the nature of suffering and lived an ethically sound way of life and attain the result, then there is no more further suffering to be recognized and eliminated. So if you uh, um, look at the way in which the Buddha taught, first of all, the nature of suffering, nature of the Four Noble Truths, the functions of the Four Noble Truths, and the fruits of the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths and the practices based upon that, what we see here is uh, a fundamental pattern that is uh, and that reflect the understanding of the stages of the path within the, Buddha, within the Buddhist tradition. Uh, so here what we see is in the Buddha's teaching um, uh, a pattern of a journey of a, a, an individual from the starting point of an ordinary human state. And here uh, the human uh, existence is really uh, seen as the ideal a physical existence to engage in the Buddhist path because Buddhist path and practice involve maximum uh, utilization of human intelligence and therefore human existence is really seen as the ideal uh, uh, bodily existence to engage in the Buddhist path. So what we see here is a pattern of a, uh, of a journey, spiritual journey where starting from the in individual uh, or, you know, ordinary human state through a gr progressively uh, more awakened state, ultimately culminating in the attainment of full liberation as well as including full awakening of Buddhahood. So when you look at it in this way, um, there is some truth in uh, some people when they characterize uh, Buddhism as a form of humanism because it, is, it essentially presents a path that unfolds from an individual ordinary human state to an enlightened state. Um, and this is quite different from the basic pattern of a spiritual path in, and, and the evolution of the spiritual teaching uh, in the theistic traditions. In the theistic tradition, the fundamental uh, origin 
of, of the spiritual teachings is a form of a revelation coming from a transcendent being. From there, there is a kind of a more top-down uh, evolution, whereas in the Buddhist uh, uh, spirituality, the evolution is more from bottom up, from the level of an individual, ordinary human being to an awakened state. Now, of course, one can raise a question saying that even in the case of Buddhism, Buddhist spirituality, are in the teaching the parts themselves taught by an enlightened being, the Buddha, in, in other words, the Buddha, the historical Buddha. Here, of course, uh, a common uh, understanding that is shared by, you know, one, one perspective that is commonly shared between uh, uh, the Theravadins and the non Theravadins is that up until the point when Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya, Buddha was a Bodhisattva, a, a, a sentient being. And, and under the Bodhi tree at Bodh Gaya, Buddha attained full awakening. That marks transcendence from uh, an ordinary uh, human being to an awakened, fully awakened Buddha. But even in the case of Mahayana perspective, where the historical Buddha uh, even from birth is already seen as a manifestation of someone who had already, already attained the embodiment of the four kayas, the four Buddha bodies. Even here, uh, one will have to uh, recognize that the Buddha's you know, deed of attaining enlightenment under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya has a special significance because the significance here is to illustrate to the followers of the Buddha that the Buddha's path has to be uh, is, is a journey from a state of ordinary human being to an awakened state of full Buddhahood. Uh, in fact, there is a statement in one of the sutras, uh, scriptures, which states that um, all the Buddhas of the three times uh, are and will be uh, Buddhas who were uh, uh, initially ordinary sentient beings who through the journey uh, became fully enlightened. Ta Dhamma Sumba Gokwe Dhamma Siddhyadi Ta Anad Thakil Labdiyagi Ta Tungye Lara Kyanta Chanayam Kimirundu Dungi uh, Dunga Dundegi 
ကာဆိုတဲ့ဒီစရာဒီရှန်လာဖန်တီတူနီယုံကိုရေစရာတုန်ရေစရာဒီရှန်လာနှစ်ပါချင်းနီယုံကိုရေစရာကိုတူတင
So um, talking about suffering and its um, origin and the third, particularly the third noble truth, which is the truth of cessation. Um, so the truth of um, so what we need to do as practitioners is to really inquire into the very question of the possibility of attaining such a cessation. So what we mean by cessation is a state where even when you are confronted with the causes and conditions that would normally lead to afflictions and give rise to suffering, uh, a cessation refers to a state where you will not uh, these causes and conditions which, may, uh, which would otherwise lead to suffering and afflictions would not have the power to create afflictions and sufferings anymore. So that is the, st uh, the, tr the truth of cessation. And so when we talk about the cessation, we're talking about the cessation of uh, the suffering. And already we spoke about three different levels of suffering, the evident, obvious suffering of our sensations, and the suffering of change, and suffering of uh, pervasive conditioning, which is the more fundamental level of suffering. So by engaging in the path and you know, uh, living an ethically sound way of life, uh, one will be able to gradually uh, eliminate the causes and conditions that would give rise to these three levels of suffering, beginning with uh, preventing the causes and conditions for the evident, more uh, um, obvious sufferings, and then the suffering of change and so on. And uh, so when we look, so, so what becomes important is to inquire into the causes and conditions that lead to these degrees of suffering. So, when, so this immediately takes us to, this, to the understanding the second truth, which is the truth of origin of suffering. So uh, generally, when we speak of the origin of suffering, we are talking about two primary factors here. Uh, one is the karma, karmic actions, volitional, intentional actions, and the afflictions, which are uh, the basis from which these actions arise. And between these two, the principal uh, origin of suffering really is, are the afflictions. Um, so whereas the, when we talk about karmic action, we are really talking about a subset of the larger cause and effect uh, events. Um, so what is unique about the karmic causation is the involvement of a sentient being and his or her intention. So when intention gets involved into a chain of causation, a new set of, a new chain of causation is created, and that new chain of causation is referred to the karmic causation. So it's really a subset of the wider cause and effect uh, uh, processes. And, uh, and so the karmic, um, so most of the uh, uh, important actions that we engage in that really matters, that has significant consequences, tend to be actions that are uh, driven by intentions or motivation. So, and it is uh, the motivation and the intention that determines the, the, the quality of the actions that we engage in. So when we talk about the motivation, we are talking already talking at the level of our states of mind that give rise to these actions. And here, the aff afflictions uh, have a very important role in, in um, uh, creating the intention and the motivations that we have. And so, and, and at the root of all of these afflictions is really uh, ignorance, because um, there is not a single sentient being that would willfully, knowingly uh, create the causes and conditions for his or her own suffering. Uh, because our basic aspiration is to aspire for happiness and to wish to overcome suffering. So all our activities are really driven by that fundamental aspiration. But so we still continue to uh, experience suffering and uh, um, suffering because somewhere there is an ignorance involved of the causal uh, uh, conditions that give rise to suffering and, and the pain. And here, um, they, when we speak of ignorance, there can be different types of ignorance. The ignorance with respect to the karmic law of cause and effect. Uh, and also, uh, even this ignorance, um, uh, sometimes we may be uh, aware of what are the, uh, the, 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 the causal relations of an intentional act and its consequences. Uh, yet, still, we can continue to create conditions for suffering because 
there is a deeper level of ignorance, which is not just related to the causation, but also uh, based upon a distorted understanding of our own experience, our own existence. And this is referred to as the ignorance uh, pertaining to the nature of our own reality. Uh, so in other words, uh, um, much of our actions are kind of driven by, uh, at a very fundamental level, a grasping at a false sense of selfhood, some kind of uh, 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 concrete self. And therefore, um, if one is interested in the project of attaining uh, freedom from suffering, it becomes crucial to understand whether or not there is a possibility of getting rid of that fundamental ignorance. Uh, and it is in this context the Buddha's teaching on uh, the no-self, anatman, becomes important because it is only by cultivating that insight into the true nature of self, which is no-self, that one will be able to undo this fundamental ignorance. So when we speak of ignorance, we are talking about a state of mind that is either a mere form of unknowing, just ignorance, simple ignorance, or we are talking about a state of mind that is a distorted form of knowing. Uh, and therefore, we are talking about a state of mind whose perspective is contrary to the actual reality. So if that is the case, then uh, at least in principle, this suggests a possibility of removing that ignorance because, because it is a distorted form of knowing that, which is contrary to the actual reality, there is a possibility by cultivating its opposite perspective, which is a correct perspective on reality, one may be able to eliminate this ignorance. And here, um, the, the, the teaching on no self becomes crucial. So when we speak of the Buddha's teaching on no self, of course, within the Buddhist tradition, there are different uh, uh, interpretation of the Buddha's teaching on no self, uh, various levels of subtlety. And the main uh, primary uh, um, interpretation of the Buddha's teaching on no self that we shall be following here is that of Nagarjuna. Uh, and Nagarjuna, according to Nagarjuna, um, the, the full understanding of no self can arise uh, on the basis of understanding um, all phenomena and being devoid of inherent intrinsic reality, objective independent reality. And um, so, therefore, the, the Buddhist teaching on no self thus become directly related to the teaching on emptiness, the Buddhist philosophy of emptiness. Uh, and so when you uh, understand how the teaching on emptiness is relevant to this um, uh, concern of seeking uh, the, to, to end suffering and its causes, and then we will see that, um, that, the, the, that the teaching on emptiness has a great significance. And when we talk about the Buddha's teaching on emptiness, um, the, the full explanation of emptiness is not found in the first a turning of the wheel of Dharma, which is the teaching on the Four Noble Truths, but rather in the second turning of the wheel of Dharma, uh, which includes uh, teachings such as the perfection of wisdom, and including the statement that I cited right at the beginning of this talk, that the mind is devoid of mind because the essential nature of mind, the nature of mind is, is clear light. Um, so what this point is, uh, a further level of understanding of Buddha's teaching on dependent origination. Earlier, we understood the teaching on dependent origination only at the level of cause and effect relations and cause and effect dependent relations. Now here, when we bring the teaching on emptiness, we can understand the dependent origination also on the basis of mutuality of dependence. Uh, where the concepts are mutually defined uh, you know, on the basis of each other. And, and in this way, the understanding of the principle of dependent origination becomes much more uh, uh, ex extensive. It's not confined only to the conditioned phenomena, but it embraces the entire spectrum of, of all phenomena. And um, so in this way, if you understand, then you will understand that all phenomena are not only dependently originated, but also they are dependently designated. Therefore, none of them possess any independent identity of their own or independent existence of their own. And they are, their existence can only be uh, uh, posited on the basis of a dependent relation. So therefore, because they are devoid of independent 
identity in existence, they are, uh, they are devoid of any substantial uh, reality. Um, and the, the state of mind that perceives them to possess such intrinsic objective existence will therefore be distorted. And by eliminating that distorted uh, state of mind, which is ignorance, one will there be able to attain the true cessation. So it is in this way the teaching on emptiness and no self becomes directly related to the, the, the teaching on cessation, the Buddha's the third noble truth. Yeah. Ah. Ah. Tedevi Dungin Yorishi, Nishi Ink Gokin. Te. Ta. To Salustayona, Yon Sivich. Haji, Yon Sare Saburchi. Ta Yunduzane, Ta Ti. Tobchigi, Tavia, Lapuviare. Ta Delia. Lam Commercial House at the Dimbury. So that day, Lam So Santon City, Commercial City, Tony Dove, and the Shiraz Sundigi, that she did the Sungiari. Tamit of Shiraz Sundigi, that Donna Chizor Dove, the Hangdon, that Tiki Guyari. They only are sent this Jigbe, Sandang Lavati Guyari. They only are to do love of Guyari. Tell any love of Sun Sin Sungari, love of Sung Lam Yam Nin Chevet Tane, any Rimbegi, any Lamji Tembongomati, Pagwe Lamri, Pagwe Yishi, Timo to Chene, any Banja Kayan Rumoji, Muji Nyambu Chene, any Banja Rimbepa to Sandra. That did it. So that Pansha said her, you better, to G. The Kesha GD, Sam Ranchi, you S. Our Sasun de Ati, Sam Timil, Lava Change, you know, Kadine, any Sam Masabo, the Timus I never saw star, Sam Chisin never in the Timonea Shavina, any Sam Gundi Harding, you know. Tumor marriage, negative, any shamas, <laughs> whichever. So that to me, 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 to to me, 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 to to me, to to me, to me, to me, to to me, to me, to me, so today, in this case, change law laws are not telling you what to do. You have to do it. That rank you will not be able to get it. So change you will not be able to get it. So today, in this case, rank you will not be able to get it. That is the rank of the seventh, 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 Sedig Sheve Tene, Mombe, Wangi Kesheve, Trivello Senemedo, Motivo Lodi, Namachatoris. What a two seni, any Lamji Temba, Gomne, Kone Kondo, any Loya, the Petoris, that is only. So, um, so with respect to the truth of cessation, as a result of reflecting deeply on the manner in which our fundamental ignorance distorts our perception of reality and how our fundamental perception, uh, this ignorance really is not in tune with the actual reality and how this fundamental ignorance serves as the basis of all the afflictions and the attendant sufferings that it gives rise to, um, one, when one becomes uh, um, to a point where it comes to a point where one can see at least in principle the possibility of bringing about such a, such a cessation, and then one needs to seek the ways and means by which that cessation can be actualized and attained. And here, of course, the fourth noble truth, uh, the truth of the path, becomes relevant. So uh, when the Buddha speaks about, therefore, when the Buddha says, therefore, cultivate the path, um, um, actualize the cessation and cultivate the path, um, he is talking about the path that would lead to such cessation. So in the 
context of the vulnerable to the principal path that is being cultivated is a deep insight into the nature of ultimate reality when there is a synergy between uh, a, a, a tranquil state of mind, a calm abiding, and a deep insight into the nature of reality. So there is a, tran a combination of tranquil, uh, tranquil mental state and an insight. Um, however, in order to cultivate that principal path, uh, one must first uh, establish the basis, which is uh, an ability to retain one's focus of mind single-pointedly on a chosen object. So here, what, therefore, one needs to cultivate the concentration, qualities of concentration. And in order to cultivate such qualities of concentration, one must ground one's way of life in a sound morality and observe the basic laws of morality. And so therefore, the Buddha taught in actual practice of the path, he, talked what is, he taught what are known as the three higher trainings, higher trainings in morality, higher trainings in concentration, and higher training in wisdom. And so it is therefore by engaging in the practices of these higher trainings, one will be able to actualize the path, cultivate the path, and then actualize the cessation. So then the question is, why is such a cessation possible? The, the, the one of the fundamental uh, reasons for this is, as explained before, the essential nature of mind is pure. You know, although our mind is diluted, but the pollutants of the mind are adventitious uh, because our essential uh, nature of the mind is this mere luminosity and experience, and at that level, the mind is pure. And since all the pollutants of the mind that obscure and, and afflict our mind um, uh, arise as a result of accidental or, or occasional conceptual, conceptual processes, including the afflictions, um, one can see that by penetrating into the ultimate nature of reality and seeing through the deception of our fundamental ignorance, one can remove these. Uh, because if our essential nature of mind itself is diluted, then there, there is no real hope. Because so long as we possess mind, we will possess a deluded mind. And we can never envision the possibility of a continuity of mind that is free of these pollutants. However, according to Buddhism, the essential nature of mind is pure, and uh, it's mere clear light. And the pollutants that obscure mind really arises from these conceptualization and afflictions, uh, and all of which are grounded, rooted in this fundamental ignorance. So therefore, by removing this fundamental ignorance, the whole processes that give rise to these uh, uh, adventitious pollutions can be removed. And in this way, one will be able to actualize the true cessation that one is aspiring for. Um, and, and therefore, the fourth uh, noble truth was taught, which is uh, cultivate the path, cultivate the true path. Then Tantrayana, I think one special, I think the unique thing about Tantrayana practice is uh, make distinction, grosser level of mind and energy and subtle level of mind and energy, make distinction. Then the subtle mind, usually the grosser level of mind, active. The subtle mind remain inactive. 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 So try to uh, that? try to subdue the grosser level of mind, so that the subtle mind then become active. So then the subtle mind transform into the wisdom which understands Shunya. So that's unique thing about Tantrayana. So, 10.31. <laughs> Finish. <laughs>